Great, so that's 11.30. So first of all, I'd like to welcome you all to the 2023, if you can believe it, Heritage Capacity Fund Information Webinar. For those of you that were here last year, you're very welcome back and uh, can't believe it's been a whole year already. For those of you that are new to our funding streams, you're more than welcome. Uh, great to have you here. Hopefully we'll see your applications coming through shortly. Uh, my name is Valerie Kelly. I'm the Community and Public Engagement Officer with the Heritage Council, and I'll be facilitating this webinar today. The actual content of the webinar will be run by our Grants Manager, who is Amanda Ryan. So how today is going to work is I'm going to hand over to Amanda in a few moments, and she's going to run you through the Heritage Capacity Fund for 2023, all the nuts and bolts of it, everything that you need to know, all in a presentation. After that, you'll have your opportunity to ask all of your questions. So while Amanda is giving her presentation, if you notice along the bottom of your screen, if you hover your mouse, you should see a Q&A box. So any questions that you have, pop them in there. And then when Amanda's finished her presentation, I will put the questions to her. Um, if you want to say hello and have a chat, you're more than welcome to do so. Let us know where you are from or what your project is. Get to know some people that are in your broader heritage community. That's for the chat box. So we'll just try and keep the Q&A and the chat separate. And um, yeah, so sometimes questions, if they're put in the chat box, they can get lost. Whereas in the Q&A box, we can make sure we get to absolutely everybody. A little bit of housekeeping as well. Um, as I'm sure you've realized by now, your cameras are all off. We're in webinar format. So this is just to make it run a bit smoother because if we have microphones and cameras on, we get a lot of feedback and um, there's a chance we might be able to hear things properly. So it just helps it all to run a little bit smoother. I see we've already got one question in the Q&A, so that's great. So I am going to hand over now to Amanda, who's going to talk you through the Heritage Capacity Fund for 2023. Take it away, Amanda. Oh, thanks. I don't know now, can I deliver as beautifully as Valerie, my colleague? Uh, but as Valerie said, I uh, look after the grants for the Heritage Council. And this scheme uh, is open now for applications until Monday, the 16th of January at 5 p.m. on the dot. The system will shut down. So it is like all our grant schemes, it is competitive in nature. Uh, we rece I think we funded approximately half of the applications, a little less than half of the applications we received last year. So that gives you an idea of the competitive nature of it. So what I'm going to do is just share very brief, it's very brief, um, uh, presentation, and then we'll open it to questions and answers. So I'll just share that now. So can we see that, Valerie? Good. OK, so Heritage Capacity Fund 2023. Now, we always put in a little disclaimer, uh, but uh, we feel very confident that uh, we will have the budget for 2023. We have it verbally, just waiting for it in writing. Um, so uh, they just run through key dates. So the first we opened on uh, the 16th of January at 5 p.m., online grant system. Uh, we are hoping to allocate a million euros this year. We had a little less last year, I think it was about 820,000. Uh, and a slight increase this year on the maximum uh, grant you can seek, and that's gone from 50,000 to 60,000 per organisation. The outcome will be available at the end of February 2023, and you have until um, the 17th of November 2023 to submit your reporting and claim. So assessment wise, we screen them first and that's basically filtering and we look to make sure that the organisation is eligible first and then that the uh, relevant supporting information has been submitted. It then goes on to internal, internal professional officer assessment. We usually do that individually and also meet collectively to discuss uh, applications. And then a, a short list is uh, put forward to an external panel who then score and make the final recommendations to our board. And they meet towards the end of February. And it's after that then that everyone will be notified. So this is new for this year. 
This is about organisation eligibility. Uh, so not-for-profit heritage-focused organisations with a demonstrated national relevance. Um, the revised definition for this year means basically that if you're a subsidiary, for instance, of a local authority or another government body, even though you have a separate constitution, you really you're not eligible to apply for the scheme this year. You should look at the Heritage Stewardship Fund uh, as um, a form of applying. This scheme is purely for non-governmental uh, bodies that depend on funding and uh, charitable donations, revenue, et cetera, to keep their operations running. So the constitution of the, of the organization should also prohibit any kind of payment to directors. So that uh, takes out any kind of private company clause. Um, so what you can apply for, we are looking for applications for core costs, operational costs. This is not a project driven um, scheme. If you have a specific project that you'd like to apply for, apply under the community grant scheme, or if you're connected or a public body, apply under the stewardship fund. Uh, this is for essential overhead, salaries, rents, rates, operation, all the unsexy stuff, but it is what is needed. These are core costs that you need to deliver your work plan. Professional institutions, we look at bursaries for professional training and uh, for funding of specific personnel to deliver those CPD courses. Uh, costs to help your organisation become more resilient in the future, for example, business plans, reviews, uh, strategic planning, even indeed new software like project management software, agile software, anything like that that's going to help uh, bring your organisation forward. The hiring of new staff, if you're looking to include that in your application, you must provide us with a job description for that person. Uh, making your application can't start. I say it all the time at these uh, info, info webinars, and that's read the application guidance document. Uh, the for new people to this to the scheme, it's template series of questions. So answer those concisely. Use pages three. Oh, sorry. Sorry, gone forward too quickly. Apologies for that. Use pages three and four of the application guidance as a template checklist. These these are the list of required documents. These this list applies to all applications. So you can't decide. Oh, my organisation. We don't need audit. We don't have audit accounts. We don't need to submit those. Uh, yeah, you do. And if you don't have them, then you shouldn't really be applying to this scheme because this is for organizations that are properly established, have legal bearing and have full audited or accountant checked account accounts. So uh, that list, as I say, applies to everyone. And if, for instance, there, there's one or two towards the end of the list, I think it's about letters to confirm other sources of funding. For instance, if your organisation doesn't have other sources of funding, just put a note, uh, upload a note to confirm that. So just don't ignore um, anything on the list and think, assume that you don't need it. Uh, again, if you plan to recruit a member of staff, then the job description. The outcomes on page five, use that as a template to uh, use the headings to demonstrate uh, your uh, proposed outcomes. Um, demonstrate, there's questions, there's a communication section on the template application form, and that's all about promoting your work and engaging with the public, really important aspect of all the Heritage Council's work, and in particular with the funding we give. And that includes organising an event for National Heritage Week or National Biodiversity Week can't stress the power of images. Assessors love them. So please provide photographs. You could have photographs of community events you ran last year, anything like that, the kind of show. It, picture speaks a thousand words. So it just, it's very supportive of your application. 
And this is important as well. Don't assume that assessors will be familiar with your work. Treat it almost like a job application, you know, put in put in what's asked, but also if you think something is relevant, include it as well. Um, for instance, if you're a museum, um, put in pictures of images of your collection or how important certain items are. Uh, again, a lot of times applicants fall down in that they may have a relationship built up with the Heritage Council in terms of funding, but we have new staff coming in and out. We also have uh, different assessors annually. So don't assume that they know what you, how good the work is that you're doing. Um, and just general advice, again, that pages three and four are for the list of supporting documents, must upload them all or acknowledgement if one of one or two or more don't apply. Um, supporting documents, please save them in JPEG or PDF, not Word docs. This happens as well. People upload documents that are not in the JPEG PDF format. And then when we go to open them, uh, they actually don't open for us. Uh, don't put any symbols in your file names uh, and just clearly label them as per the content. Um, all up uploaded files to the system are checked for viruses, so that notice will appear. Don't panic, you can continue to work. You can even submit your application while the virus checks are going on. Start your application as soon as possible um, and upload whatever supporting information you have. It has happened lots of times where people with the best of intentions at five o'clock on the deadline are pressing the submit button and it shuts down. So don't be in that position and traffic will be very heavy on the final day. So allow for that as well and any IT issues. Um, so we have a new uh, email address set up for grants at heritagecouncil.ie and we're going to put together a frequently asked questions uh, document and post that on our website. So any queries after this is being recorded as well, so it will be um, uh, put up on our website if your colleagues couldn't make it today. And uh, so really it's over now to any questions people might have. I'll be delighted and hope I can answer them. Thanks, Valerie. Great. Thanks a million, Amanda. So we've got a couple of questions here. And if you have any others, do keep popping them in um, as we're speaking, because we will get around to them. So first question is, if an organisation has received support in 2022 and the work programme for the employee is part of a three year plan, is it OK to include that continued work in the 23 application or are you looking for new ideas and ventures? Uh, no, Trey, you can include that. That's good strategic planning. So no, we are going to be supporting existing uh, work and also new initiatives. So yes, do, do include it. Great. Um, are you supplying a job description? Is this still necessary if an organisation is applying for funding to cover a salary and the person has been in the role for a number of years, albeit their role is dependent on receiving Heritage Council funding? Thank you. Uh, hi, Helen. Um, it, well, it, uh, it's more for new staff, but I would uh, say, again, because assessors, we will have new panels formed. Assessors might be familiar with the work you are doing. So maybe just a brief summary of the type of work that you've been undertaking. It doesn't have to be exhaustive or extensive, but just maybe a summary of what's involved would be very helpful. It would be more supportive than not. Just to kind of, as I said, there's going to be new people looking at applications. So uh, it's important not to assume uh, that everyone is familiar with what you are doing. Great. Um, one of the groups I am involved with is not a CLG, but is a not-for-profit committee with a simple constitution licensed to run a nationally, nationally relevant heritage site. Is there a way to verify if the committee would be eligible to apply before we spend time making the application? Uh, well, I suppose, Sally, I would look at the list of um, required documents uh, that we have on the application um, guidelines, pages 
what should I say, page three and four, uh, one of the things that uh, is important is the accounts or audit audited accounts are accountant verified. So if you can provide those and your constitution, uh, it, ideally it would be preferable if you were a CLG, but um, a not-for-profit, um, you're still, con you know, you still have some uh, legal binding and you have a constitution. So, uh, yeah, I would suggest you do, you look at that list and um, you can also, you know, I can, we can take uh, specific queries to your organization if you want, if you want to email us directly, but it's really, it's really the um, supporting documentations that are documentation that's required. So if you're able to meet that, I'd say, yeah, absolutely apply. Great. I think this next question will um, be on a lot of people's minds. What constitutes an organization of national importance? Uh, well, there's there's kind of there is definitions in the application guidance. So it's really that you're delivering work that's uh, can be linked directly to national plans like Heritage 2030. Uh, our own strategic plan won't be published until February, but you could link it to our existing one, which is available on our website. Um, anything that's of national level. Uh, also, I would say that where groups may not have an audience at national level and are more maybe focused regionally, if you can make the case that your specific work could be modelled elsewhere or developed and um, at a national level, then yes, we have a, a number of uh, applicants organizations that we funded um, over the last few years whose project area is more on a regional basis rather than on a national. But as I said, it could be modeled anywhere. Um, and uh, that's the, the, you need to live, when you're made doing your work plan, you would need to link it to those kind of national level, high level uh, documents. Great. We have very limited cash flow. Something we've struggled with before is making all the payments before we draw down the generous grant funding. Has there been any progress on being able to draw down on the basis of invoices? Uh, yes, we, we do. We, um, we, every year we seek a special dispensation from the, our parent department that we can pay out based on invoices to not-for-profit groups. So that's in place annually and it's in place this year. This year we were able to pay out, I think, up to a maximum of €30,000 based on invoices alone. Um, so I hope that, and we, we will be doing the same for next year, going to the department early in the new year to ask for that, which is, I apologise, to ask for that special um, uh, sanction or to, to pay those based on invoices. Okay. If you are applying for support to deliver your organisation's work plan, do you need to detail the entire work plan in the application or do you just include highlights? Um... Well, uh, I, phew, that's a good question. Um, I suppose it would be good to see, like, oh, um, well, obviously you'd need to, to give the work plan that uh, is specific to the heritage elements of your work, but mostly people would, would give us their, their work plan um, for the year. Um, so I would say I'd err on yes rather than no, uh, because then it's clear in terms of capacity uh, to the assessors, you know, if the organisation is going to be deliver, deliver, able to deliver on what they have uh, planned for the entire year. Uh, these next few questions are all of a similar theme um, about like other areas of funding. So the first one is, can an organisation apply for both this scheme and the heritage in the community scheme later in the year for separate initiatives and projects? Uh, to be frank, we do look at organizations that apply to us under different grant schemes and they are like for instance jason if your organization was given funding under the this scheme and another application came on in under community it would receive a lower priority uh, especially now going forward we are looking to streamline grant schemes 
better in terms of who can apply so that there's a fair distribution of funding across multiple organisations. So this scheme specifically is uh, the core cost, but included in that you will be delivering projects. So I would say if you're applying for this, put an application in for it all, don't be coming back under a community with a smaller project-based um, initiative or just don't apply under this and wait till the community grant scheme is advertised in January and apply under that. I think we are hoping to increase the maximum grant under that scheme to about €25,000. And the next one then is, if you are in receipt of funding from elsewhere, could this affect your chances of a heritage capacity grant? Uh, absolutely not. You actually, as part of the supporting documentations, you do have to list where you are planning to get funding uh, from uh, other what other organisations. And uh, our, the main thing we'd be looking at would be that there's no um, uh, threat of double funding. So no um, organisations that apply to us would have different channels of uh, funding coming from different bodies, public bodies. So no, it doesn't uh, affect your application, but you do need to disclose it. Um, OK, so moving on, oh, there's, there's another similar funding one. So in supporting information, you note in number seven that a list of other funding sources you intend to apply for in 2023 is that only in relation to, say, the new position we might be applying to fill, or is this funding applications in general? Um, it's okay, Lisa, what the funding you intend to apply for? I would say um, you get, provide the list and you can, I mean, it, a list is, I'm sure that it, it's not that long and maybe just in brackets highlight, you know, what that funding is going to be used for. I'm talking one sentence, you know, a few words. It just, it's clear. And uh, as I said, it's better to, uh, sh you know, show this type of information than uh, not. So, yeah, I as I said, keep it, keep it short you don't but just you know list those organizations but uh, if it is going to other aspects that doesn't impact on this that particular um application like just state it okay so this next one then is about the completion date so could you tell me if the requirement for all funded activities to be completed by the november reporting date will still be in place with this year's grants for example, if a bursary was awarded by the NGO for professional training, that the training would need to be complete before November to be eligible. Is that still the case? Uh, like we can't, we, we wouldn't be able to, uh, yes, that would, because we can't fund something that hasn't taken place. So um, if, for instance, if it's a bursary, um, to do an education course that has a different timetable, uh, we can set in, as we have done previously, we set in place where the student reports after the fact, but in terms of maybe an organisation providing funding, um, you, you have the power to set those deadlines within our deadlines. But I don't know does that answer the question, um, but uh, it, as I said, if it's a bursary to a student to undertake a course that's delivered over, uh, I know school uh, education calendar year is different. Well, that's a separate issue because that's beyond the control. And uh, we just put in place kind of special conditions, I suppose. Um, an organisation I'm involved with is a CLG, but they have one director nominated by the County Council and another nominated by the local development company. Would this deem them ineligible? Uh, one director is nominated. I'm not sure, but I know where we're where the I just explain where the local authority public body comes from, and you can check yourself with your constitution. It's whereby if an organization um, is struggling financially, that they are set up in such a way that the local authority uh, will uh, 
will provide funding. So it's kind of like a security blanket and that's written into the constitution. So if that's written into your constitution, then you would be ineligible. Uh, but if it's just a case that um, uh, that it's kind of a representative, that I, I, you know, I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure, Josephine, to be honest. So I suppose I'm not going to. Uh, what I can do is I will find out with somebody that that is um, an expert in this area that has been advising us. So I actually might uh, seek her advice on this, but I know where it came from was applications last year were from um, organizations that were set up as CLGs. They had their separate constitution, but under the fine print of their constitution, if, they, if there was financial difficulty uh, that the local authority would be able to step in and and indeed, their staff members were paid by the local authority. So it's really that kind of clause that we're trying to um, avoid. But I will, I'll bring your um, query to our um, expert. Great. And the last question that I have here is, if a group currently have no staff and no office, sp office space, apply for salary support for a new employee, but have that employee work within another organisation, who administers their salary on behalf of the organization uh, i think it should be can the group use the funding to cover this oh dear uh this is if a group i have to read this again sorry nula if a group currently has no staff and no office space apply for funding to support or new but have that employee work within another organization I will have to, I'll have to read that again, Nula, and come back to you. There is quite a, I have to get my head around it, to be honest. Um, I'll, I'll have to come back to you on it. Um, uh, I, I actually can't, it's a little bit complex, but I think we had a similar situation this year. So I don't want to give you a, a half estimated response. I prefer to uh, look into it a bit more and give a more resp uh, informed response. So if that's okay, Nula, um, we'll come back to you early next week on that. And the same, Josephine, with your inquiry. Great. Uh, we had another question come in there. If funding support is provided for a salary, is it necessary to break down all the allotted hours across all the projects listed in the work plan based on the 150 slash 300 euro categories? Or is the headline salary or payslip sufficient? Uh, no, you don't have to provide pay slips. Uh, just at their salary. I mean, there's agreed salary uh, for um, staff, so it doesn't have to be broken down on an hourly basis. Um, so I hope that answers uh, your question. And if you are a provided um, a funding at the end of the year, what we look for is uh, kind of. Uh, 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 like a ledger or a, a printout of your most recent uh, accounts and a letter uh, from the director of the organization to confirm, you know, that those are the true costs. So we wouldn't be looking for pay slips or anything like that. Um, I hope that answers that question. And uh, we have more of an operational question on the actual webinar itself about the replies when you have more information, if they can be emailed out to all attendees. Um, we should have a registration list in Zoom, so we should have everyone's email um, information there, so we should be able to send that on to you. Um, if there's something specific that you want, uh, all of our contact details were there at the end of the webinar, so if you do need to get in touch. It's, yeah, it's... it's Oh, sorry, Valerie. It's grants at heritagecouncil.ie. And we will uh, we'll also actually, rather than emailing out to people, we'll answer the uh, those two specific queries. But as I said, we're going to form a frequently asked questions um, document and we'll have that uploaded and it'll be a live document. So we'll we'll add to it if kind of pertinent questions come in between now and the close off. 
Um, and I would say uh, I, I'm kind of uh, I'm going back on this year. I know a lot of you are still have been funded this year, and you're waiting on payments. Uh, we had a backlog. We had st have staff out sick, long term sickness. So there is a backlog, but we have to have everyone paid by uh, this day week. Uh, so um, uh, you will be paid before Christmas. We are as anxious to clear our budget as ye are to receive your funding. And apologies for uh, the delay on our part. Good. Well, that is all the questions dealt with there. And as I said, if you do have any further questions, feel free to um, email them to us. Uh, oh, I see some's come through there. Um, oh, they're just thank yous. Always nice to see. <laughs> uh, so thank all of you so much for coming along. And as we said, this session has been recorded. We'll have it up online as soon as possible. Uh, so don't worry if you missed anything in your note taking there, you'll be able to review it all again. And feel free to send it on to people as well that might have missed this. And yeah, good luck with your applications. We'll hopefully see them all coming through uh, very soon. And as I said, if you have any questions, do get in touch. Uh, better to know before you go to all the work of the application. And yeah, that's us for another year. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye-bye.